And the 12th plan was done, the 12th plan ends in the current year, and we may not have another plan after. I don't know what the decision is on that, but I read in the newspapers. But there'll be some thinking about what, what our likely growth rate is. The 12th plan, when it began, was quite optimistic, but as we formulated the plan, recognizing the impact of the Eurozone crisis, et cetera, we had lowered the growth target to about 8%. We're probably not going to be 8% during this period, but it'll be some 7 plus, which is not too bad. Looking ahead, governments always uh, use broad numbers. Uh, I've seen numbers like we'll get back to 8 to 10%. You know, I feel that as and when uh, that is worked out and perhaps uh, the Niti Aayog will produce some documentation that will give out the thinking on that subject. I don't think it's very important to focus on 8 to 10 percent. Right now, in my view, uh, globally what people think is that if we can follow sound policies and maintain the pace of reforms, India could carry on growing at about 7.5 percent. Now maybe we can beat that a little bit and do better. Uh, but even this forecast is based on continuing reforms which are what trigger productivity. You know, I want to emphasize uh, the role of productivity in any growth process. Because, you know, in the old days, people used to say investment leads to growth. So very simple kind of way, uh, if, you if, you, if you had a capital output ratio of four or a little above four, and you were kind of investing a little above 20 percent, then maybe you could get a growth rate of about 5 percent. Now, actually, one of the big structural changes that has occurred in the economy over the last 10 years is that we're investing much more than 20 percent. I mean, our investment, at one time, our investment had gone up to about 34 percent, has now come down to about 31 percent. Now, whether we can get back to 34 percent, this depends. But you know, at around 31, 32, 33 percent GDP investment, uh, and you take into account uh, the labor, the contribution of the growth of labor, and you do it differently from the way they normally do uh, incremental capital output ratios. You, you do a decomposition of growth, where growth is the result of growth of capital, growth of labor, and productivity. Now, if you do it that way, then you can come up with relatively easily uh, that if, if India's productivity growth improves, instead of being 1%, which sometimes it has been during our poor performing periods, if it can go up to 25 or 3% per year, then India's GDP growth rate could be 7.5%. I'm just giving you rough orders of magnitude <coughs> that even to achieve a 7.5% growth, there has to be an improvement in the underlying growth of what is called total factor productivity. Now, nobody actually knows what total factor productivity is, and economists have invented this as some kind of a concept, but actually what it means is that when you put in the capital and you put in the labor, you need an overall increase in productivity, which is different from the growth of the capital input and the growth of labor input. Now, what is it that causes this overall increase in productivity? You know, for a rich country, say the United States, uh, the overall growth in productivity depends on how much the frontier moves out. And that generally moves out rather slowly. And now, today, there are a lot of people in the U.S. saying that uh, that underlying growth of the frontier may be slowing down. I mean, you get different views on this, but there's a lot of work saying that, look, the underlying growth of productivity may be slowing down. This is not relevant for a country like India because we are very far from the frontier. So that is what gives a developing country uh, the prospect of catching up and leapfrogging. Uh, how to catch up with the technological prospect that actually exists providing we can be nimble enough to restructure our processes and sort of get to a level of productivity, uh, which is now feasible, but which took uh, industrialized countries 25 years to get to. 
I mean, a good example of that is, uh, say, the productivity that comes in. If you bring in, well, we were discussing Uber and Ola. I don't want to be an advertisement for either of those companies or any of our own uh, subsequent um, 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 domestic uh, alternatives. But here's a good example that this thing didn't exist in the United States two years ago. Um, and we're talking about it in India now, and I frequently find people, at least in Delhi, they sort of bring out their cell phone and they order a cab and they say, oh, yes, it's just turned the corner three kilometers away. Now, that's a good example of leapfrogging because you completely bypass the whole period and move straight away to a different level. Now, this needs to be multiplied across the board. But the key to this multiplication is, is the system flexible to allow disruptive technologies to be brought in or is the system extremely resistant to any such technological change? And I think a lot of the times when they talk about reforms, they're talking about creating an environment where things we can't actually predict, but which reflect a creative urge in the system. When I say creative, it doesn't have to be original, maybe just copying something that's happening elsewhere, <coughs> but it can make a huge difference to the local level of productivity. That's really what economic reforms are all about. Now, I think that, you know, uh, one, one factor that I would say is that <coughs> there is a huge amount of agreement on what the areas are where these reforms are possible. They're normally, they're generally never agreement on whether any particular government did a good job of pushing those reforms. That's fine. That's competitive politics. <clears throat> but if you ask anyone, what do you think India needs to do? You know, there are very few people who would disagree with the list that I'm now going to read out. <coughs> They'll all tell you that you need macroeconomic balance. You need lots of other things. But if you don't have macroeconomic balance, everything else will get disrupted. So rule number one and the biggest responsibility of the government, particularly the national government, is to ensure macroeconomic balance. And that, I think, is well, well recognized. It's not even a political issue. Uh, we know that. Second thing they'll tell you is that, well, infrastructure in India is pretty poor compared to many of our competitors. It's improving. And when it improves, people see a huge difference. <coughs> but, you know, between watching a couple of modern airports uh, and sort of making sure that the whole system is modernized, there's a big gap. So what needs to be done is very large. I think there's agreement on that. The real question is, how do you actually go about getting it done? Now, I, I would add that this becomes a little more controversial. I would add that the demand for infra and infrastructure, by the way, dominantly, to my mind, means, as far as production infrastructure is concerned, it really means power and it means logistics, different kinds of transport, but logistics in the sense that the system must be such that you can have an integrated movement uh, of uh, items through multimodal means of transport so you can get things to and from. Many studies have been done between Chinese productivity and Indian productivity at the micro level. And you know, these studies have found that at the factory level, the productivity in India is not that bad compared to China, may even be just as good. The difference is that if you are running such a factory, it takes you four times as much to get stuff into the factory than it takes in China, and probably the same amount as much to get it out of the factory to the ports and the waiting in the ports and things of that kind. So it's a, it's a system response. It's not just making sure we get some good roads here or put an airport there. It's a system response in infrastructure. I think most people agree with that. It is ease of doing business. But, you know, I don't even want to talk about it because everyone is talking about it. The only thing I would say, and we talked about this in the 12th plan, great length, that, you know, you can make a list of things that businessmen talk about. And half of them belong in the domain of the central government and the other half belong in the domain of the state government. So actually, the first thing we should do is to stop each of them
each of these two levels of government pointing the finger at the other. I mean, I think each of them should look at what's in their domain. And I think if both, if the national government and the central and state governments were to be able to accept the proposition that in two years' time, these are the improvements that you will see in those aspects of the ease of doing business that fall in our domain. And if each of the states were to do that, I think we'd be much, much better off. I mean, as far as states are concerned, they're competing with each other. And that, again, in the last 10 years, has been one of the very important changes in India. You know, people don't just talk about conditions in India. They talk about <laughs> conditions in particular states. And people who may be quite negative about perceptions of uh, business environment in state A are actually very positive about the business environment in state B. And you know, to some extent, the business environment in India is effectively a reflection of enough states which are like state B. And of course, the central government has to do what has to be done in its area. Um, I think that a, a new phenomenon which, uh, which has been there in the last few years and is getting more emphasis is the recognition that progress, particularly in industry, is not just going to come from the traditional big industrial houses. They are very important. They perform a huge function. They need to do a lot of investment, but they are not the ones that are going to produce jobs in the scale that we need them. Now, on the other hand, we have not done, neither the central government nor the state governments have done enough to create an environment in which smaller businesses and particularly startups because when you talk of disruptive technologies, you know, disruptive technologies invariably come with startups. It's not guys with legacy systems who are doing well who start inventing disruptive technologies. It's guys who are just getting into the market, think they're smarter than the fellows with legacy systems who will do it. And here, I mean, I have to thank Sunil because when just after he had stepped down as revenue secretary, uh, I had set up a small group in the Planning Commission to look at what sort of incentive mechanisms do we need to encourage small business and particularly startups, which he headed. And my rationale of asking him to head it was that most of the problems usually lie in the taxation area uh, and in the way the tax system treats new companies. And I thought that having a former, a recently former revenue secretary heading the committee would give it a lot of weight uh, when those recommendations are examined in the finance ministry. So actually I've also asked him to give me uh, his assessment uh, in the, this government and the previous government because the report was actually submitted to the previous government in the last couple of years of it. Now what is his assessment? that how much of what they recommended have we got done. I think we need to look at this, but there's ample evidence, and you see that from the newspapers also, that in the space, which is generally called whatever, startups, venture capital, angel investors, different times you have different names, and they do mean different things also, this seems to be bubbling. It's actually minuscule in terms of absolute level. What is good is it's there. And it's not just one person and it's not just two pe people. So there are a number of them. But you know, if you ask me, there ought to be 10 times that many. So the real question, the real question is, are we going to end up with a business environment and a supportive institutional structure where what we now see as happening in a number of areas is multiplied tenfold over. I'm just saying tenfold because tenfold is a good number to start with. I mean, actually, it has to be a hundredfold in due course, but tenfold is a reasonable number. And I think that both the central government and the state government need to focus on what is needed to get that going. Uh, because I think that will actually take care of one of the problems that we have had uh, in our industrialization, 
which is that when we say small and medium, we have really meant unviable, minuscule industries. I mean, if you look at the distribution of firms in India, we have a reasonable concentration of the bigger fellows, similar to other countries. But we don't have people in the middle. And actually, the real role of the small and medium is that they're the most, they're the most able to quickly become medium. Our whole policy has just been a multiplication of low technology, small scale operations that really are not able to keep up with the competitive pressure that is needed in order to integrate with the rest of the system. So that is a big issue and I think it relates to lots of things related to infrastructure. It also relates to a lot of things which are related to finance. And now I want to mention the last of the points which I think Sunil also talked about, which is new. And again, it started in the previous government. It's been given a lot of emphasis, which is good, in the new government. And that's the whole issue of financial inclusion. Uh, the chief economic advisor has coined this phrase, jam. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the jandan and the aadhaar and the mobile. You know, financial inclusion is a very, very big gap in our system. The number of people linked to bank accounts is far too small. On the other hand, and I think Su uh, Sunil mentioned this, uh, the regulatory changes by the Reserve Bank of India, combined with technology developments in mobile phones and handheld devices, combined with the ability to do biometric unique identification via Aadhaar has actually made it possible to do two things. One is to link a huge number of people to bank accounts and the second is to make sure that transfers that are due to certain people identified in some way go directly to their accounts in the banks bypassing all sorts of intermediaries and this and that. Uh, how fast it will happen, we have to wait and see. Certainly the number of Aadhaar, uh, uh, the Aadhaar numbers has increased hugely, about 900 million or something like that, uh, most recently, the largest digital ID base in the whole world. And if we can combine, give these people access to the banks and also channel a lot of money that otherwise goes to them through the banks. I mean, take the simplest thing, which is Narega payments. I mean, if Narega payments, instead of being handed out, whether through checks or whatever it is at the local level, are actually all transferred directly to bank accounts because each person who is entitled to receive a Narega payment actually has an Aadhaar-linked bank account, that will be a huge gain, both in terms of making them realize that this thing is not just a facility for rich people who have cars but can be availed of by fairly ordinary people, it would e also avoid uh, leakage. Because by definition, I mean, one person can only have one identity and you won't, one ID, and you won't have a situation where the same person is getting the benefit under five different names. Because whatever he does otherwise, he only have one Aadhaar card. And all the evidence that I've seen in terms of studies, etc., suggests that the reduction of leakages could be very large. Now, you know, these are, these are new things. They are, they're there, they're started. They haven't yet achieved a large enough scale. But I think it is possible that, you know, if they are pursued uh, relentlessly, uh, then the gain of scale will ultimately lead to a lot of gain in productivity. Uh, Sunil mentioned uh, transferring subsidies uh, via cash transfers. That's one of the most obvious and important potential uses of this kind of system. Uh, but other uses are simply that once people get linked to bank accounts, uh, you can find a huge number of other g benefits. I mean, for example, a person moves from one place to another place. If his entire financial record can be traced through that unique ID, he would be in a position to be able to share that information 
with other people who he wants to establish a credit record with. I want to emphasize that he's in control. This is not uh, a violation of privacy where anybody can go and do whatever they like. But you may be in a situation where you move from town A to town B, you want to borrow from a bank, you've not ever borrowed from that bank, you've not borrowed from any other bank, but you can show that you borrowed from a cooperative bank where you were and you were a regular payer and that you regularly paid your utility bills and this and that at a certain scale, that establishes some kind of credit history. That establishes access to credit. So I think that, you know, those are the kinds of things that could make a huge difference to bringing about inclusion. So I've just given you um, a few examples. Now one could go on and on, but I won't do that. I want to stop at this point and maybe open it up for questions, simply to say that uh, if you take a very conservative view based on the likely supply of capital and the likely supply of labor, you would end up with uh, growth potential for India of around 5.5%. And if you add 2% possibility in terms of productivity, which is not at all unreasonable. Let me say that China, by the same criteria, achieved productivity increases of 5%. So, I mean, if we can get 5% on inputs and get 5% on productivity, we would get a 10% growth rate. But I'm assuming we won't get 5% because we're not that disciplined a society. But we have in the past had periods when we got 25 and even three, according to some measures. So the name of the game is really to keep that going. And that, to my mind, gives you somewhere between 7.5 and 8%. Now, when people say they want to do even better, that's great. And I, I mean, you know, I think if we demonstrate that we can do 7.5 for the next five years, I mean, nothing stops us from trying to do even better because 7.5 is not the end of the story. And by then, I think the global, global environment will also be a lot clearer, and one can judge how things are moving on that score. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'd be very happy to pursue any of these issues uh, to whatever extent anyone in the audience wants. Thank you. easier to see if you didn't have the lights because you know at the moment I mean <laughs> anyway okay yeah why don't you you're the moderator so you firstly firstly I would like to thank you very much sir for having for having shared with us you know your your uh, broad prescriptive strategy for the areas of focus that we need to address if we are to grow and obviously that's the whole objective of, uh, of the government, whichever government is in power, it doesn't really matter, but that's the overall strategy. And uh, we, I, 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 would, uh, I would also submit that I think this is a very good approach because you've, you, you've left enough uh, room for questions and issues to be raised, which will, uh, which will facilitate your you know, explanations and also any clarification that may be required, and we can take it forward from there. So I, I would uh, open the floor for questions, but uh, when you uh, would you would you please also identify yourself so that we know who you are. <laughs> A microphone. Yeah, well, okay, if you shout, that's okay. Hello. Certain uh, cues or certain initiatives which you think uh, uh, you know could could act as a stimulus for for uh, you know the the exports to go up uh, going forward, uh, and also the fact that uh, has it primarily been uh, you know uh, uh, have we been a victim of our own undoing in the process, or is it more of a macro global factor in the process? 
that's that's uh, mm -hmm. you know that's the first question and the second question pardon my ignorance uh, during the course you also mentioned about you know the concept of frontiers the fact that us is very close to the, its frontier vis-a-vis -vis india uh, you know i i just couldn't uh, fathom, i just couldn't understand the concept of frontier thank you okay uh, on the first point let me say there's no question that what's happening on trade uh, is dominantly a global phenomenon because you know lots of people will tell you that the relationship between world trade and world GDP has changed very dramatically and in the last year or so for the first time the real growth of exports the volume growth of exports has been less than the volume growth of GDP now in our case it's been negative in value and negative in value in dollar terms the dollar is actually appreciated so um, I think what's happened is not uh, uh, not inconsistent with what has happened globally. That doesn't mean that we can't do better, I mean, obviously through better productivity, increased market share and all the rest of it. And that's something that will play out over time. But the initial uh, negative is dominantly a global phenomenon. Now mind you, it, it hasn't produced the same uh, problem for us that otherwise it would have on the balance of payments simply because the collapse in import prices has given a huge advantage. So we we'll probably end the year with a balance payments deficit a little over 1% of GDP and which can be easily financed by the capital inflows particularly if FDI is picking up and we we'll end up with foreign exchange reserves that were higher uh, than they started at the start of the year. But you know uh, long term I mean you know, our exports are quite small uh, in, in world terms. So we need, we need to look at how we can be essentially more competitive. Now you know here to us, to my mind, uh, the most obvious thing is that China is much richer than us. It has higher wages. Its restructuring of its own demand has got to be in, in the direction of consumption and not in the direction of investment for which there's no global output. And what they did, I think, in the first couple of years, I'm not an expert on China, so if there are any Chinese present, I apologize, or even Chinese scholars, that I may be getting it wrong. But actually what they did was, when they, when they lost exports, they just put a lot of money into investment, infrastructure, buildings, ghost towns, and this and that. Now, you know, you can do that for a little while, but it puts a huge stress on the banking system. What they should have done, in my view, is to increase consumption. And the way to increase consumption is to increase wages. I mean, Chinese wages, in my view, are too low compared to their per capita income. Now, if they were to do that, it would be a huge benefit for everybody because the Chinese would then be importing things to consume. Maybe we can sell them stuff that we are competitive at. And more importantly, they would become uncompetitive at the lower end of the um, sophistication structure of their exports. They themselves, in any case, are moving up. I mean, they want to be the world, they are the world's dominant producers of solar panels. They don't want to be, they don't want to be the world's dominant producer of you know, garments and these kind of lower end products. Well, the question is, are we going to occupy that space or are we going to let Bangladesh do it and Vietnam? At the moment, the national policy is that we will let Bangladesh and Vietnam do it. Now, this, needs, this goes back to why, and if you talk to businessmen, they tell you, that we need better infrastructure, better logistics, and more flexible labor laws. Now, I realize that we had a discussion earlier with some friends, and I realize that's a very controversial issue. But you know, uh, we have been saying, at least in the Planning Commission, we used to constantly say that it is entirely logical. I mean, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that our labor laws should be abolished. You know, we need, we need sensible, strong, protected labor laws. But there is no particular case why our labor laws should be the most restrictive in the whole world. Uh, on the other hand, if it is a political decision, and I, I'm afraid this is a completely bipartisan issue, because, you know, I mean, all political parties are unwilling to face this. Well, all that's going to happen is that the rest of the world is going to benefit and will bless us for the extreme concern and care that we have in protecting labor rights so that those who are employed get protected and those who want jobs don't get them. I mean, that is the net result of the, of the labor policy we are following. 
And this is across political parties. Because, you know, the real thing is the states are free. 